Thank you very much. We turn now to topical questions, and our first question is from Lee MacArthur. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its projections are for the prison population in light of statistics showing that the majority are at or above capacity. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef. After a number of years of relative stability, the average prison population has increased over the past year. Scotland currently has the highest imprisonment rate in Western Europe with around 144 per 100,000 of the population incarcerated. The most recent projections suggest population uh, levels over the next 12 months are likely to average around 8,000. Scottish Government officials are working with the Scottish Prison Service to consider the immediate issues that are associated with this. In addition, we have committed to take action to reduce the numbers of people entering prison for short-term periods. Uh, in the budget, we confirmed additional funding to local authorities to increase the availability of alternatives to remand. We've also increased funding over recent years to support the availability of community sentences. And finally, once provisions within the Domestic Abuse Act 2018 come into force from April this year, we'll also bring forward, of course, the necessary secondary legislation to extend the current presumption against short sentences from three months to 12 months. Lee MacArthur. I thank the Justice Secretary for um, the candour of, of that response and again the confirmation, uh, as was the case back in June, um, that the government is committed to reducing uh, the use of imprisonment. Fast forward six months from that parliamentary uh, answer and the average prison population is up by around 300, meaning the number of prisons operating at or over capacity has more than doubled. Prisons are jam-packed and staff are warning of the impact that this is having. The Scottish Government said it acted on, quote, almost all the recommendation of its decade-old prisons commission, but the experts were critical then of a prison population of just over 7,000. They wanted to see a reduction to 5,000. It is now, as the Cabinet Secretary confirmed, uh, almost 8,000. Can the Cabinet Secretary therefore explain the reason for this failure? Cabinet Secretary. Let me uh, also thank Lee MacArthur for, uh, in general, the, the tone of his question. I know it's an issue that he uh, takes seriously. I think there's actually quite a lot of consensus around the parliamentary chamber uh, around the fact that uh, we don't want to be, uh, we don't want to have the highest imprisonment rate in Western Europe. It's actually, I mean, it's a statistic really not to be proud of uh, at all. What I can say is th there are some complex reasons for uh, the rise in the prison population. Uh, for example, um, the type of offences, so we're seeing more and more sexual offences come to our courts and therefore people being found guilty and going into our prisons. Uh, that, that, there is a number of reasons for that which I won't go, go into, but there, there is that. There is the fact that um, <coughs> behaviours of the judiciary, we are seeing that uh, those uh, who are being giving, uh, given long sentences, and particularly life sentences, the punishment part of that sentence is longer now than it was a decade ago and substantially. Uh, longer as well. And then we're seeing more recent trends. We were just talking in committee this morning around uh, the changes in the HDC, home detention curfew, uh, and of course the less that is being used, then of course the prison population uh, therefore uh, rises. So uh, there's a lot that we will do to tackle this. I think the presumption against short sentences of 12 months, if that passes through this parliament, which I look to the Liberal Democrats for support for, uh, could be a significant tool to help us reduce the prison numbers, prison population. Liam McCarthy. <coughs> Can I thank the Cabinet <coughs> Secretary for uh, that response? Let me turn um, now to the, uh, specifically to the women's estate. Last year, the Chief Inspector of Prisons, David Strang, warned that because the new female prison estate would only hold 230 prisoners, quote, much work is still required to reduce the number of women in custody ahead of the new prisons opening in 2020. The female prison population currently stands at 381. So I wonder, therefore, that organisations such as the Howard League, Scotland, SACRO and others are so concerned. So will the Cabinet Secretary now confirm that the timetable has slipped and that, there are, uh, that three of the community units won't even be started by the 2020 deadline initially set by his predecessor for the completion of the new estate? And can he confirm just how many women will benefit from the new estate in 2021? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'll be able to provide uh, the member with fuller detail. And, uh, I'll look to follow that up. I, I don't have uh, all of that uh, detail in front of me. But what I would say to, to the member is we are absolutely committed to uh, learning lessons uh, of, of a variety of reviews, in fact, that have taken place looking into the specific issue of female offending. We know that women offend for and, and are imprisoned for, for perhaps very complex reasons uh, that can often be quite different to, to the male population. Uh, our plan of, of, of community uh, CCUs uh, community custody units right across uh, Scotland uh, is taking shape. We, we have uh, planning permission in Glasgow and Dundee 
um, and, and, and I think that uh, is an important step forward. Uh, what I would say uh, to the member is that when it comes to the presumption against short sentences, uh, from the numbers that I've seen, uh, certainly in the data that I've seen, that will have a disproportionate positive impact uh, on, on the female offending population than it would on the male offending population. Uh, but that is just one measure that we wish to take forward. Uh, we have to look at the male prison population as well, uh, because of course that makes up the vast majority of the prison population, to see what radical measures we need to bring forward to reduce that prison population is so, so important uh, that we do not uh, be, get comfortable, and we certainly aren't as a government, that we do not get comfortable as a society with just imprisoning people and looking at and seeing that uh, prison population continue to rise. Now, there's a lot of interest in this. There's actually five members who wish to ask a question. Uh, we'll try and get through them all if members and the minister can make progress. Uh, Rona Mackay to be followed by Liam Kerr. Thank you, presiding officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that in light of the fact the Ministry of Justice is considering banning prison sentences of less than six months in England and Wales, uh, that the presumption against short sentences as outlined in your answer to Liam MacArthur is something that this whole chamber should get behind? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, uh, just very briefly, uh, I, mean, I was interested uh, to see Rory Stewart's uh, commitments. Uh, actually, in some respects, uh, was, was uh, not just uh, went further in, in respect to ours as a presumption against uh, short sentences. I think he was talking about banning of short sentences. Now, his, uh, the, the UK model is six months, whereas our model uh, looks at a presumption against uh, short sentences of 12 months. So there are differences. Um, what I would say is that uh, where Rory Stewart and I uh, agree is that the data <coughs> and the evidence and the empirical evidence uh, is, is uh, inarguable that uh, you know, the, the community payback uh, orders, alternatives to custody, um, will do a lot more for the individual in terms of reducing reoffending and rehabilitation uh, than a short custodial sentence. So I hope the whole chamber can get behind that. Liam Caird, followed by Daniel Johnson. And thank you, Presiding Officer. Look, my party would have concerns about plans to reduce the prison population without taking account of the practicalities of that. So how can the Cabinet Secretary seek more use of community sentences when the current statistics show that a third are never completed and a third of work placements fail to start within the required seven days? Yeah, I'm saying. I mean, in, in some respects, uh, of course, the member makes a, a very valid point that uh, we have to make sure that the public have confidence. Uh, and we, of course, as, as, as politicians and <coughs> myself as, as Cabinet Secretary, we all have confidence uh, in our community payback orders. But despite some of the difficulties and the flaws which he points out uh, in the current regime, uh, the evidence still speaks for itself that uh, if you are in a short sentence, you are twice as likely to offend than if you are in a community payback order. So that evidence there is, is indisputable. Uh, it is something that the UK government has also uh, obviously acknowledged uh, in the terms of their banning uh, of, of, of short sentences of, of six months uh, or less, uh, except for violent and sexual offences. What I would say to the members, let's get together, let's work together uh, as all the political parties on board. If we all agree that the prison population is far too high, uh, and that the, the rate per head is too high. Let's get together, put our minds together and think, well, actually, what else can we do that's radical? Because we don't just need to take ourselves on this journey, but frankly, uh, as his question alludes to, we need to take members of the public on that journey as well, who may, at this moment in time, uh, not see alternatives to custody uh, as particularly, uh, a particularly robust uh, disposal, uh, sen uh, sen sentence disposal. So I think there's a lot of work for us to do in government, for sure, but equally, I think, collectively, there's a role for all of us to play in this. Daniel Johnson to be followed by John Finney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for being as candid as he has, uh, uh, which is uh, in, in, in contradiction to the, 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 the response I got when I raised these issues in the summer. However, th there are consequences for prisons being over capacity, and in particular, uh, double bunking in cells. Could the Cabinet Secretary outline how many prisoners are in cells beyond their design capacity in so-called double bunking conditions? I don't have the exact figures to hand, but clearly I'll get them provided uh, to, to, to Daniel Johnson. I would go further in his point that uh, when we have overcrowded uh, prisons, prisons that uh, have more people in them than their design capacity, then that also has an effect on rehabilitation. Uh, there is then uh, only, so, only, only so many uh, members of staff that can uh, take, uh, take, uh, take uh, prisoners on, on rehabilitation, rehabilitative programmes. So it has a whole effect. It also has an effect on, on, on the morale within a prison, uh, the amount of time, for example, that uh, prisoners can have out of their cell, uh, and then frustrations can build up, and there can be issues around uh, the staff safety as well. So there's a whole range of reasons why we would not want our prisons, obviously, to, 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 to be above the design capacity. Uh, and therefore, uh, as I say, there is a lot that we 
will do in terms of presumption against short sentences and other measures to help tackle that. Uh, but frankly speaking, if we want to see that change, which may take 10, 15, 20 years, as Finland did or the Netherlands uh, have successfully done, then we are going to have to work collectively to do that. We're going to have to take, uh, frankly, the public on this journey with us uh, as well, put the appropriate safeguards in place, but really look towards some real radical solutions on how we, how, how we reduce that prison population. John Finney to be followed by Alistair Allen. Thank you, President Officer. The, the Cabinet Secretary enjoys cross-party support for robust alternatives to custody, and there's a range of issues, restriction on liberty orders, drug and treatment testing orders, community payback orders, sexual offence prevention orders, so on, so on, and most recently, home detention curfews. Now, all of these require an active role for criminal justice social work, and I noted carefully what the Cabinet Secretary said, but nonetheless, the local authority budget has been cut. Is that compatible with his fine words? Cabinet it's compatible because the, the 100 million uh, that's ring fenced uh, for that particular work is protected. So, uh, in, in, in the budget, uh, as outlined by uh, my colleague uh, Derek Mackay, so the resource uh, is there. But I don't get away from from the central point that uh, if we are going to fund alternatives to to, to custody, um, then of course that has to be resourced. But actually, from an economic point of view, you know, it's cheaper. There is a, a economic argument. Uh, of why you want to do that. that. That shouldn't be the primary argument, of course not. The primary argument should be uh, public safety, of course, the reduction in, in, in reoffending, the rehabilitative uh, nature, but there is an economic argument there uh, to be made. So I'll continue that conversation with local authorities uh, and third sector organisations. And of course, uh, I know my colleague, Ed Mackay, is in the chamber, so I'm sure he'll be listening very carefully uh, to the remarks that you've made around uh, the adequate resource. Alistair Allen. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the importance um, for rehabilitation uh, when it comes to prisoners maintaining contact with their families, something which itself has consequences for prison numbers in the future. Given the extreme difficulty and expense which Ireland families face on visiting prisoners, what can the Scottish Government do to be of help to families in this situation in Scotland's islands? Cabinet Secretary. That is a very good uh, point that the uh, member raises. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm aware of uh, these discussions from my previous ministerial role. Uh, transport uh, and uh, the islands. Uh, if the member would like, I can give him information uh, around uh, the assisted prison visit scheme. Uh, that helps those who are travelling distance with travelling costs, so I can get the in in information excuse me, uh, to the member. Also, making more use of technology is hugely important. SPS is doing that, so uh, of course, it doesn't replace uh, that kind of face-to-face -face, uh, physical uh, uh, visits, but nonetheless, uh, it can play an important role uh, and family contact. So there's a range of, of, of work that's being done. Uh, if you'd like, I'll furnish them with further details in writing. Thank you very much. Question number two, Pauline McNeill. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to support the reported increasing number of people who are struggling to pay their rent or mortgage. Cabinet Secretary Aileen Campbell. Thank you. A, a decade of austerity alongside UK government welfare cuts and the benefit freeze impacting on the local housing allowance and housing benefit has taken its toll. That is one of the reasons we established the Financial Health Check Service to support low-income families to maximise their household incomes last year. We're supporting people through a number of other actions. This year alone, we're investing over £125 million to mitigate against the worst impacts of welfare reform, including effectively abolishing the bedroom tax and supporting those on low income. In housing, our 2016 Private Housing Act improves security for tenants, limiting rent rises to once per year with at least three months' notice. This also provides tenants with the power to challenge unfair increases. In addition, since 2007, we have helped more than 28,000 households buy their own home through shared equity schemes. And vitally, we have delivered more than 80,000 affordable homes since 2007 and are on track to deliver our 50,000 affordable homes target for this parliament, a commitment that the UK government's approach to Brexit could jeopardise. We, of course, though, don't want anyone to have to worry about paying their rent or mortgage or any other bills. And I would certainly urge anyone who is struggling to, to seek independent advice as soon as possible. Pauline McNeill. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that comprehensive reply. New research on behalf of Shelter Scotland found that 12% of respondents were currently struggling to pay their rent or their mortgage. And that's equivalent to 200,000 households. But recent figures show that the cost of private rented housing has soared above inflation in many parts of the country. For example, in Glasgow, a one-bedroom property is an average of 4.2% in increase. In Edinburgh, in the Lothians, is an average of 6.5% on a two-bedroom property. But staggeringly, in the borders for a four-bedroom property, it's a 25.6% increase. 
Does the Cabinet Secretary not agree that it's time for more radical legislation on restricting high rents to protect ordinary people from these exorbitant increases? Cabinet Secretary. Hey, and, uh, I am well aware of the shelter report and the analysis that, and the research that they carried out, which I think you know, has some very uh, important messages there for uh, everybody in this uh, chamber. And certainly I would echo again some of the words that shelter made through those, uh, the, pub the, the publication of the report around making sure people seek uh, advice as soon as they possibly can if they have financial worries. And uh, you know, Pauline McNeill is also right to point out some of the uh, imbalances around uh, rent, uh, the rent private rented sector, and that's why I pointed out to some of the legislation and the, 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 the work that we've taken forward around that rent increase has been limited to once in 12 months. Uh, I would also uh, point out, though, that the latest data from the Office of National Statistics shows a 0.5% annual increase in rents to November 2018 across all private tenancies in Scotland, and that's lower than the annual increases seen uh, in England. But I think she's also right to point out that some of the disparity in the, across different parts of uh, the country, she pointed out Glasgow, she pointed out Endham, and that's again why we uh, gave uh, discretionary powers to apply it for local authorities to apply to ministers for an area of high rent increases for existing tenants to be de designated as rent pressure zones, and that allows them to cap rent increases at a minimum of consumer price index plus one percent. However, we have to look at the basket of measures, and again, uh, I'm very happy to work with Polly McNeill to explore ideas that she may have, but certainly we have as a government, along with our commitment to delivering on 50,000 uh, in this parliament, along with the other measures I outlined in her original answer, along with the, the legislation that we took forward in 2016. Uh, if she has ideas about where we could do more, then happy to listen to them. But certainly we have uh, uh, taken forward a comprehensive package of work to try and protect rent, a uh, private rented sector as best we, we can. But if we want more, I'm happy to have that discussion with Polly McNeill. Polly McNeill. I thank the Cabinet Secretary very much for her offer to work with me on some ideas that I may have myself. But I think the Cabinet Minister uh, must now agree that there has been a complete failure of rent pressure zones. They might have been right for the time, but they are not right now. Edinburgh City Council said that rent pressure zones have not been designed in a way that can work effectively. And they've asked for a review of the policy. Shelter found that there are no currently um, private rent, rent data sources available to provide the rent for a rent pressure zone application. I would ask the Cabinet Secretary um, to consider that whatever the intentions behind this legislation was, it's not working and it's failed. And because of the issues I think we both agree on, it's time for a more radical approach to revise the legislation to ensure that ordinary people can stop exorbitant rents and they, as individuals, can make that application and not have to rely on their local authorities. Cabinet Secretary. I think it would also um, should be seen and should be viewed this with our, within the context of our current uh, targets to deliver 50,000 affordable homes, many of which are there for social uh, rent. And I would hope that the Labour Party do view that with the importance that's attached with it, along with, in the budget, the £800 million that's there to deliver on that target. And I would hope that they would support that through the budget negotiations that they'll be uh, having uh, with my colleague Derek Mackay, because that's an important part of this work as well, to make sure that people have that security through social rent uh, as well. But I did outline the package of measures that we've put in forward through that legislation to protect tenants, and of course happy to explore where we can uh, do more. Uh, but I would also point out that our latest debt statistics also show that the annual increases in rents in Scotland are lower than the rest of the UK but of course that doesn't take away from the fact that people in the here and now are facing struggles and again that's why it's linked to our work to tackle and mitigate uh, austerity to tackle and mitigate the worst impacts of welfare reform and tackle uh, people's uh, financial uh, concerns which is why we've brought forward the financial health check service to help people on low incomes to maximise their household budgets uh, and to maximise their income so uh, we are doing a huge amount of work across many different portfolios which is important work to help people in the here and now face the challenges that they are facing but and again you know, I offer that uh, uh, again offer uh, to discuss these issues with Polly McNeill around what more we can do if she thinks there are other solutions that we can take forward on top of all the uh, uh, work we're taking forward at the moment. Graham Simpson. Thanks. Pauline McNeill mentioned uh, rent pressure zones, uh, but not a single council uh, so far has applied to have one. It may be worth the Cabinet Secretary uh, looking to see why, why that is. 
Um, Cabinet Secretary says that uh, the government is, uh, quotes, on track uh, to deliver 50,000 affordable homes, but last year uh, just over 5,000 were built. So if we continue at that pace, the government will not meet its target until 2026. Um, so can the Cabinet Secretary uh, tell us what she is doing to, in her words, get things on track? Uh, and uh, can she pledge to build, not deliver, 50,000 affordable homes during this parliament? Cabinet Secretary. Um, again, I think we can get caught up in the semantics, but I think my priority is we are on track to deliver 50,000 houses in this parliament, which is built ba backed up by, in the budget, £800 million pounds and £3 billion over, billion pounds over the, this parliamentary session. I would hope that that would gather support from across the chamber because we are on track to deliver that considerable and significant uh, housing stock for the people of, of Scotland. And I think it's worth pointing out that between 2012 and 2017, more council houses for social rent were delivered across 32 local authority areas in Scotland than across 326 local authority areas in England. I think that shows this, the success that this government has had on housing, the success we have in our, on delivering uh, affordable housing for the people of Scotland. And while Graeme Simpson might want to get caught up in the, the language, I'll get, uh, I'll get busy with making sure that we make good on our ambitious target. Thank you very much. And that concludes topical questions. We're going to move on now to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion 15380 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham on securing a just transition to a carbon neutral economy. Could I invite all members who wish to contribute to this debate to press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible?